The following is a clip from the live breakdown and analysis of Giuseppe Roberto Tarantino's dissertation specifically on the open gaming license submitted in 2019 for a PhD in the field of intellectual property law. This dissertation is publicly available. The link to it is in the description. Okay, so consequences of the OGL and overview. The OGL has been regarded positively by many professionals within the RPG industry. The OGL and the D20 system serve as an entry point for numerous publishers, who begin by creating D20 system materials for use with D&D, and then further develop and deepen their own publishing lines. Clark Peterson, principal of Necromancer Games, described the OGL and the D20 trademark license as a wonderful addition to the health of the role-playing hobby. Lisa Stevens, CEO and Watsy competitor Paizo Publishing, noted, uh, that the OGL and the T20 systems had inspired an explosion of RPG books the likes of which the gaming industry had never seen before. Many publishers who made the use of the OGL to release material went through a maturation process. process. During the first half decade following its release in 2000, there was a consistent pattern of publishers using the OGL in conjunction with the D20 trademark license, as Watsi originally intended, to create RPG materials for use in conjunction with D&D. Over the subsequent years, many of those same publishers then dropped the D20 trademark license in favor of utilizing the OGL on its own to create their own standalone games with which to compete with D&D in the RPG market. For example, Mongoose Publishing produced six different games using the OGL between 2003 and 2006, including games based on Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian character and Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers novel. Troll Lord Games likewise started using the OGL and D20 trademark license in tandem, but then moved on to publish Castles and Crusades, a standalone game released using the OGL, which tries to evoke the feel of early versions of D&D. The Year of Living Free wiki, uh, devoted to cataloging free and open source RPG or free, free and open source games, identifies 64 separate games, including D&D, that have been released under the OGL. The Fossil... Fossil Bank Wiki lists 154 separate games released under the OGL. While the subjective views of OGL users regarding L OGL's impact will be explored further in subsequent chapters, this preliminary overview turns to public statements made by two prominent figures in the industry, Ryan Dancy, the originator of the OGL, and Mike Merles, one of Watsi's leading game designers on D&D's uh, fourth and fifth editions. In a variety of different forums, Dancy has articulated his views on the consequences of the OGL. Dancy has identified a number of different rationales for the creation of the OGL. He has described it its primary goal as helping to relaunch the D&D game and expressed the views that the OGL succeeded in accomplishing that goal. He also stated the purpose of the OGL was to act as a force for change, and in that sense, I think it's an unqualified success. Describing the OGL as a driver of innovation, Dancy's description of the changes brought about by the OGL can be understood as structural in multiple senses, but most saliently, he described the OGL as having altered the relationships among publishers, professional RPG developers, amateur players, and the content itself. As he wrote, the OGL changed the relationship of fans to publishers. Any person with an idea could participate in the market if they wished. It also changed the relationship of developers to publishers. Developers were free to show that their creativity using a wide, widespread system, which also meant their talent could be more easily determined instead of having to first decipher a whole new set of notations and rules. Dancy also stated that OGL altered the delivery systems for RPG content. Prior to the OGL, other than perhaps a magazine submission, short-form material had no viable commercial market. Likewise, the idea that an electronic-only product could be marketed effectively was doubtful. Dancy described having been amazed and surprised at the number of commercial adventures that got started around the OGL, and he highlighted that in terms of getting more people into the business of publishing tabletop RPGs and more people into the role was paid to do the RPG design. The OGL broadened and deepened the talent pool in the industry. A particular note, in light of the OSR and creation of the retro clones, Dancy wrote that as he had also had the goal that the release of the SRD would ensure the D&D in a format the release of the SRD would ensure that D&D, in a format that I felt was true to its legacy, could never be removed from the market by a capricious de decision of its owners. So that, oh yeah, so th that is part of making sure that, well, there's going to be some form of this out there, even if the company that owns it completely tanks it or does something terrible. Hmm. <laughs> the OGL, in other words, served as an archival function as well. Preserving the accessibility of the game and the vagaries of assertions of intellectual properties from the vagaries of assertions of intellectual property rights by a recalcitrant owner. In his interview for the research for this subject, Dancy took pains to make it clear that the development and realization of the OGL were the product of a team effort involving many people at Watsi, but his closing words from the interview encapsulated his view of the impact. Thousands of other people took it and did create new and did creative and exciting things with it outside of the company and are still doing that today. Dancy also identified negative aspects of the OGL, D20 systems innovation. A glut of OGL crap flooded the market. I remember that. And some RPG publishers tried to shoehorn into the D20 system games which would be, have been better served by other mechanics. 
There was an organ. There were also organizational failings, which Darcy noted. He viewed Watsi's abandonment abandonment of the D20 trademark license as a mistake. He thought the OGL itself should have been updated to address certain drafting deficiencies. The treatment of software handling content from multiple sources and citation of sources. And he bemoaned a lack of central authority clearinghouse, which could make OGL license content searchable and accessible to future designers. Ultimately, however, Darcy's assessment of the OGL was positive. I sleep pretty well at night. I think the OGL was a benefit to the industry and to players, and I think this is still generating good works. In 2008, prominent game designer Mark uh, Mike Merrills wrote in a blog post entitled, Has Open Gaming Been a Success? Merrill's assessment was somewhat more equivocal than Dancy's. He described the OGL as having some successes and some failures. The primary failure he identified was a, pro a processual one. The iterative design process embraced by software developers, which leads to the content, continuous improvement in software code, did not meaningfully translate into the RPG market. Merrill's had hoped the OGL would lead to an active community of designers, all grinding away on D&D to make it better. But, but, that desire res but that desired result happened only in a fragmentary manner. That failure to transpose the open source process into the gaming environment is, in Merle's view, a function of differences between software and games. RPGs lack easily defined metrics for quality, success, and useful features. Unlike software development, where the open source code process allows for rapid identification and fixing of problems, the RPGs suffer for the crippling problem that no one can agree on what problems need to be fixed or how to fix them. In Merle's final assessment, open gaming was not a failure. It just took a different path when compared to software. Merle's observation is a reminder that although they share some common structural elements as described in chapters three and four, open source software licenses and open content copyright licenses need not, indeed should not, be judged by the same criteria. Open source software licenses are meant to facilitate, through the inputs of multiple contributors, continuous improvement of the software being designed. Since the notion of an improvement is one that is not easily transposed to creative expression, the lack of consensus the OGL resulted in improvement is not necessarily fatal to the assessment of the value of the OGL. As was discussed in Chapter 4 and will be further explored, further explored in Chapter 7 and 8, the context of creative expression, the relevant object attention for the criterion of improvement may not be the work itself, but rather the community of consumers that work and the level of participatory engagement undertaken by them. In ultimately concluding the OGL was a success, Merles identifies three interrelated factors with the following orientations, market, community, and individual. With respect to the market, the OGL and the design of 3.0 facilitated short, cheap, but imminent useful designs, which helped catalyze, in turn, benefited from the nascent use of PDF files and e-commerce platforms, such as drive-thru RPG, to distribute and sell OGL-licensed RPG content. OGL publishers did not need to rely on printed materials, historically the main delivery mechanism for RPG content, and instead can distribute their publications to consumers by means of PDF downloads. In Merle's view, the use of PDFs to disseminate RPGs benefited immensely from the OGL. The community and individual fac factors which Merle described are the sharing and training that were facilitated by the OGL. Open gaming, the indie movement, the PDF sales have made it more possible now than ever for a good GM with a knack for writing to put together a book and get it out there for others to see. Merle's highlights that game designers use the OGL to swap stuff back and forth and that sharing might be the best thing open gaming can offer designers. In Merle's view, the OGL made it more likely for writers to build and sustain a skill set that would be attractive to potential employers in the RPG industry. And Lou was talking about that the other day. The OGL, amplified by the technology of digital communications and easy online dissemination, resulted in the RPG market recruiting a far, far larger talent pool of talent, and there are more people today designing and publishing RPG material than ever before. Open gaming made more people into designers and publishers, and that's a good thing for this hobby. The OGL's ultimate impact in Merle's telling appears to be that it furthered and was furthered by technological driven changes in the RPG market. Reduced, along with aforementioned technological changes, barriers to sharing, and in turn facilitated the development of writing design skills among a subset of RPG player community who wanted to become game designers.